Hi, everyone. Uh, again, yeah, Bill Connor in here. I'm with uh, Watershed in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and uh, as Steve mentioned, I had a uh, business development strategy for Watershed. Thank you, Steve, by the way, for uh, kind of all your help this morning in facilitating this and to Ashley on the Watershed side for your help in setting this up. I'm delighted to be here. Really excited. Um, this session uh, is on learning analytics, uh, and that's a topic which has, and I'm very grateful for this, <laughs> become pretty hot lately. Uh, in fact, recently we surveyed uh, 2,300 learning professionals uh, in a, a study we literally just published last week called Measuring the Business Impact of Learning. Uh, and frankly, in itself, that's a pretty cool indicator of interest. 2,300 is a lot of people. Uh, and ultimately, you know, what we found was that interest in this topic of applying analytics to learning particularly within large enterprises, has skyrocketed. 94% um, of those surveyed have or want to adopt learning analytics into their uh, business. Now, when asked why they haven't started, if they haven't started, um, the most typical response was conflicting priorities. Uh, and, and I understand that. Um, Yes, absolutely. Sorry. I, I, I said I wasn't going to look at the Q&As, but it's so much more fun to have this a uh, little more interactive. So thank you for saying that. I will definitely send a link to that report at the end of this now. Um, but uh, anyway, what I was saying was that the, uh, the conflicting priorities is the number one reason why people, a barrier, I guess, why people haven't gotten started. Uh, and I, that's absolutely understandable. The other would be um, uh, just not knowing where to start. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Um, I will say for those of you uh, on this, one of my colleagues, Andrew Downs, noted on a webinar that we did over that uh, measuring the business impact of learning that a lot of our friends and customers uh, in the industry who do find where to start uh, tend to get uh, promoted, which is encouraging. Again, data is having a moment, and thank you for being curious um, about that now. Um, last November, I went to my first in-person uh, event in some time uh, that was a degreed event and it was in Los Angeles and it was pretty cool. There was a, a speaker there, Nancy Duarte, who spoke about telling stories with data uh, and she's fantastic. I would definitely encourage you to check out her book, which I believe is literally called Telling Stories with Data uh, and her TED Talk on persuasive stories. Her last name is D-U-A-R-T-E. Um, she was great. She's a real advocate for helping those who are excited about data tell stories on how to show impact. And that's frankly often a great place to begin your learning analytics journey or any journey for that matter. So um, with that, I'm going to start with some stories. Um, I've given this presentation a couple times before, and uh, it's always fairly well received. In fact, some folks had asked us who are on this call had asked us to uh, kind of review it. Um, but it started feeling a little sales pitchy, and that is not blatantly my intention today. Um, the thing about our company, the thing about Watershed is, uh, you know, we're really enthusiastic about our community uh, and the achievements that we've uh, we've experienced over the past seven-ish years since we've been in business um, with our community and, and the achievements that, that they have also achieved. Um, so we always want to ensure a mutual good fit. Uh, before we wade into any kind of these journeys together. So I am not here today to pitch, but I am here to promote what I consider to be the inevitable, which is digital transformation and the democratization of data in learning and development, finally. Uh, we so often hear about L&D measurement or success in completions, which uh, is definitely not something to shake a stick at or speak down to. Completions are great. Uh, it's just not necessarily the full story and it's very often not necessarily a very interesting story. Uh, and that really isn't a lot of the reason why many of us got into the profession in the first place. So I'm gonna be sharing some stories that um, are hopefully a little bit more interesting than simple completions uh, from four of our customers. So we're gonna look at uh, a story from Visa, from Caterpillar, uh, from PwC and Applied Industrial. Um, and uh, then I'm gonna kind of go over a general vendor management and the learning ecosystem uh, story as well that could be applied to anybody who has a legal learning e or ecosystem. Um, and then you can tell these stories if you'd like to. Uh, I'll be showing Watershed definitely during this um, and telling some stories uh, that these customers have shared publicly. And I can also link back if anybody wants to email me to those webinars as well. You'll notice a theme. Uh, there are a lot of themes here probably that we could all learn from um, around how to get started. Well, for learning analytics, it's 
fairly simple if you ask yourself or think of of this one kind of point, which is if you understand the goals and objectives of your customer, you can provide the best service and apply your expertise to achieve those mutual goals. So I'm going to start by getting some corporate stuff out of the way and doing the kind of vendor song and dance thing where I tell you how we do what we do, uh, which is important, though um, probably Simon Sinek would disagree with me. Famously, he did not say start with how, he said start with why, but uh, I think some context could help. Uh, we are part of the LTG family, Learning Technologies Group, uh, which is a uh, a company, a public traded company based in London. In fact, I, I should take this po point to say next week I'll be in London uh, with the Watershed team and with the rest of the LTG team. Um, and if you are there at LT next week, please do come by our booth and say hi. We'd love to actually see people in person. Um, but uh, yeah, so we are part of LTG, so Learning Technologies. Um, Learning Technologies Group focuses exclusively on human resources and uh, learning uh, technologies. And so we are part of the software and platforms group. You might see some uh, LMS names down there that you might recognize, like Bridge or Confluent or OpenLMS. There are some authoring tools on there as well, Instilled and Gomo being the ones who jump out most. Uh, and then, of course, we are part of the incredibly geeky side, which was initially Rust to see software. Rust to see is kind of the keeper of SCORM, I call them. They are the back-end engine to most learning management systems and content delivery. Now, the other thing is um, on the other side of content and services, our most recent acquisition is GP Strategies, which we just um, kind of merged with last year. And GP Strategies are well known as consultants in the L&D space. They also create some really great content. And we're particularly excited about that because uh, for the Theoretic side, theoretical side of learning and um, learning analytics, uh, GP Strategies are going to be phenomenal partners. In fact, uh, in London next week, I'll be presenting with GP Strategies as well. Really excited about that. Um, also, Leo uh, do a phenomenal job of creating content. Preloaded are in that kind of AR, VR space. Uh, and then Affirmity focuses on uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging. Um, and they're, they're a great company with some awesome um, experts in that area too, to really kind of help push uh, organizations forward. Now, with Watershed, we are a learning analytics platform. So what does that mean? We're built on the world's first learning record store or LRS. Um, so we created that when we were part of Rust to see software, the geeks I mentioned before, uh, and um, uh, we were part of the Department of Defense's XAPI program. At that time, it was called Tin Can. And I don't want to go down that path too, too far, uh, but just learn or know that uh, the, the people who are on our team uh, have a very long uh, history of being involved in the practical application of uh, learning analytics and in, um, in, in learning in general. Um, we're L&D focused. So our goal is to provide insight and kind of spark curiosity not just in analysts, uh, but in instructional designers and trainers and managers, people leaders, because these could be the roles that are technical in theory, um, like practice of education, but not necessarily sometimes in things like data migration or coding or even, you know, knowing which reports to ask IT to go get. We want to empower that curiosity, and we want you to constantly ask questions of your data ecosystem and of things that are happening in the uh, in the space that you've created to better serve your customers. Um, this slide is a fairly typical learning ecosystem. However, we didn't create this. Visa created it, one of our customers. They shared it with us uh, a long time ago, I would say probably five or six years ago. The team at Visa were really quite forward thinking. Um, and we're going to look at one of their use cases here in a minute. But I always use this slide when I start kind of talking about the how, again, of how Watershed does what we do, because it's very familiar, I think, to many. Because uh, on the front end, of course, is this portal, Degreed. I mentioned them earlier. Um, and they're their learning experience platform. Right behind Degreed, so that's where, the, that's where the learners are coming in. Right behind Degreed are the tools that make up the ecosystem. So this is the learning management system. You can see Cornerstone, there's Pluralsight, LinkedIn Learning, a lot of things that are probably familiar to you. And then you get some very specific things like Git Abstract or Harvard. 
And all of these tools are putting out data and reports, and those all look dissimilar from one another. So there's an inherent problem there. Watershed aggregates all of this and normalizes that data. So it all looks the same. So all the reports make sense. And then further, we enhance it by applying HRIS, Human Resource Information System data, ERP system data on top of that. So in this case, it's Workday. Uh, and that would apply a hierarchy so that all the ecosystem is able to, to you know, uh, be viewed by Visa and they're able to apply permissions and restrictions. And then reporting, of course, um, they can report on groups, uh, geographic locations, individuals, roles, you know, whatever. So. Uh, in the case of Visa, like most of our customers, the data is received and uh, in Watershed normalized, and it's reviewed and kind of manipulated by the uh, L&D team, and then ultimately served up into a global data warehouse. In this case, it's Tableau, uh, but it could be Power BI or R or whatever BI tool uh, you, know, you prefer, which brings up a really logical question. Why would I use Watershed if a BI tool does what a BI tool does? Great question. Uh, I know because I just asked it. <laughs> uh, but our customers find that Watershed does a really good job for learning and development specifically. So we like to think that kind of out of the box after we implement, you might have the top 20 to 25 questions that you were curious about answered. And hopefully we like to think that we inspire a lot more questions. Um, and another reason why you might go with Watershed or a learning analytics platform over a BI tool is frankly about partnership. Um, whether formal or informal, partnerships are incredibly powerful at Watershed. Uh, we, we take the burden of establishing connection, the data connection, as well as the partnership connection. We take it very seriously and we maintain that connection. So we work with the data provider uh, and our customers to maintain integrity of connections ongoing throughout your journey. Our customers really love that. And speaking of, um, uh, of some of those platforms, we recently rolled out a program that we call Works With Watershed. And this is really um, basically platform integrations for very common learning and development systems. So obviously, as we mentioned, you'll see Read and Cornerstone up there just saw it, the Visa slide. We also see success factors in EdCast, Credly, very hot right now, uh, Workday, Lessonly, a few of those other LTG companies I mentioned earlier too. But you'll also note Salesforce and SurveyMonkey and other tools that are typically outside of the world of learning and development. So Salesforce is a good uh, um, option because it's almost universal, at least with our customers. So for instance, Salesforce is the performance tool, right? And we're going to talk about how performance tools actually help the watershed learning analytics or just learning analytics in general here in a minute. But it's important to note before I go down that path that if you have a platform on here that you don't see, we probably have worked with them as well. These are just the most common ones that our customers have brought to us that we integrate with most often. And speaking of which, when we think about the ecosystem, um, our customers have all built these ecosystems. And as I mentioned earlier, therefore they have wildly different reports in data and ultimately that leads to report overload. And that's because as I show here, formal learning, informal learning, on the job learning, they all utilize different tools and they all have their own different set of data. And this is absolutely overwhelming, of course, but also again, report overload. The term Excel hell, although uncomfortable, is thrown around a lot with our prospective customers. And that's just on the L&D side. That's just on the learning platform side. I mentioned performance a second ago. Very often learning and development doesn't even have visibility into what they are tasked with helping employee behavior change in performance. And, and that's, that's the system that they're being measured in. So for instance, Salesforce, as I mentioned, is a CRM, right? Now I've worked in organizations where uh, the L&D team were tasked with helping roll out sales methodologies, maybe to increase calls or increase meetings, uh, ultimately to drive revenue, of course. But they have no idea if it's effective because they don't even have visibility into the CRM or whether or not I'm making those calls or my team uh, are creating those meetings. Um, so, you know, gaining insight into performance is an absolute game changer. When you bring in that data into your ecosystem, just from a reporting perspective, you could start seeing much beyond, much farther beyond whether your uh, sales team just passed or failed, of course. You're actually able to see 
if it's affecting that, or not only a course, but a program, if it's actually affecting that intended outcome. And now here's the last, this is my pitch. The pitch is Watershed brings it all, all together. So Watershed brings all the stuff together so you're able to see what your learners are doing, when they're doing it, how it's affecting outcomes, and you're able to look at all those reports and have them delivered to the right person uh, or the right group of people, whether that's inside learning and development or somewhere else in management. And you're also able to export that clean data into a BI tool. And I'll stop now about that and we can talk about something interesting, which is what our customers are doing and how they are using analytics and applying it to their business. We're gonna start with Visa. So I already kind of started with Visa, so might as well start there again. Um, I'm gonna share one of their stories with you. So again, they're fascinating and they're not just a plastic card in your pocket. Uh, in fact, Visa are responsible for things like consulting with small businesses, uh, economic forecasting, and of course, uh, you know, point of sale systems as well. Uh, the workforce at Visa are incredibly smart uh, and they have to maintain that. They have to maintain their chops when it comes to the world of finance. But years ago, Gordon, who um, has actually since moved on from Visa, he recognized that if he could provide the best training experience to his employees, he could not only retain them, he could develop them, uh, probably better than the competition too. And he cares a lot about things like that. He also cared a lot about insights and data into the ecosystem that he created. So that's it, right? How do I make sure that my employees have the best possible training? Well, he recognized that it wasn't all inside of one area. It wasn't simply inside of a LMS. So he went ahead and built an ecosystem. Again, very hot right now. But this was like six years ago. This is before the term learning ecosystem in the, uh, the lexicon, if you will. Um, so he wanted to apply analytics to that too. Now, as an example, recently our sister company, Leo, built a game for Visa. And the idea was to help their workforce with new product rollout. So they were able to, again, best advise their customers. Um, so Visa initially wanted to make sure that the game was played. They already knew that it was good, it had the right content in it. They wanted to make sure it was played because after all, without playing, without adoption, uh, games don't really matter, content doesn't really matter. So it was important to see where and when it was being adopted. It was important to see which areas of the game were being interacted with most and how many unique users were actually interacting with all aspects of the game. And it was also important that they had um, a high promoter or a net promoter score at NPS for the game as well. And they achieved it. Um, they very quickly had adoption by key players um, playing the game uh, and they played the game often, but most importantly, they played the game for a long time time um you'll note here <laughs> you'll note here that they played the game on average for three hours and 17 minute minutes and that's like i feel like it's almost a problem <laughs> if your people are spending all this time on this game however um that was the point right they they weren't off work they were actually interacting with the game that was teaching them so this just goes to show that if you create a great game well you can train people with it uh, and you can know if you've created a great game by applying analytics to it. And we know that it was successful. And how do we know it was successful? Again, because we have data to back that up. So those who played that game uh, and were engaged with it had significantly higher increase in sales opportunity than those who hadn't. And that's to the tune of like three times more sales opportunities identified than those who hadn't, um, if they played the game over four hours, that is. So now, applying learning analytics and specifically Watershed, um, these were able to go through and see who hadn't played the game yet, um, who hadn't played it all, who hadn't interacted with it all, or hadn't interacted with it for a little while, um, and who were the kind of, I guess, gaming superstars, if you will. Uh, and they could go focus on those individuals uh, and ask them questions and then help others to adopt the game. And, and that was a really encouraging thing. They also set up kind of ways to compete against one another, which is obviously very encouraging for folks who have competitive uh, uh, nature as well. So that was really encouraging. Um, with Caterpillar, it's a story that's a little bit different. So again, we're focusing on launching a successful digital ecosystem and applying analytics to that initially. Uh, Caterpillar's idea initially was to successfully launched a digital ecosystem to essentially create standardization of messaging uh, in an environment that would kind of deliver the best, most accurate, you know, safe content 
in a way that is also easily consumable and frankly, just a really good experience for the learner. Um, and it may seem kind of beside the point for, to hear from a learning analytics provider on the ecosystem, but remember the core of the ecosystem, which I'll show right here, actually uh, creates and exists all this really rich data. And when cleaned up and normalized, it, it really tells some great stories. So the most important thing for CAT uh, after launching this ecosystem, so essentially you have to think they've got over 300 uh, dealer locations. And at one point, those dealer locations had um, different messages uh, and they in, in different training in different learning management systems. And so really the idea was if we could standardize this, I think that we could we could do some pretty powerful things. So um, the most important thing after they did standardize it um, was to make sure that people were interacting with it and where they were interacting with it, make sure the modalities in which people were interacting with it were, were uh, sufficient. So they created this ecosystem with Kaltura as a video platform, uh, digitized SOPs there with Inkling, they had learning library there, and of course they had uh, multiple learning management systems as well. But they wanted to see things like, okay, if we launch this, um, what are people searching for, right? What's tripping them up, stuff like that. So uh, pre-pandemic, they took on a really lofty goal of doubling service revenue, which is huge for Caterpillar. That's like a number in the B billions. Um, their theory was that by creating this ecosystem, again, they could maintain this complex training uh, and very often it's with safety training. So they needed to make sure that that was locked down and the message was, um, was accurate and checked off, if you will. But the theory was, again, let's create this ecosystem. They can maintain complex training. They can maintain uh, detailed level safety training. They could then start promoting from within. They could recognize and utilize the expertise of the trainers that they already had and they can improve the customer experience for over, as I said, 300 dealer locations and something like 250,000 learners. Um, what they didn't really realize, again, was crisis readiness, but they were ready, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But again, all starts with adoption. So upon launch, CAT could see historic data on interactions with their dealer learning management system. That's that top right box. Tough to see. My apologies. I'll send this to you um, if, if you guys want to reach out to me afterwards. We can talk through it. Uh, but they could see the adoption and uptick of the video platform, Kaltura, right upon launch. And then they could kind of track it, right? The digital SOPs, Inkling, same way, and the Open Sesame content library. Now, pre-pandemic, their adoption was already through the roof. This was considered to be a wildly successful launch. So they started looking at things like anomalies. And utilizing Watershed, they started seeing what video content had been watched the most and what was scrapped. Um, and they can start asking questions about those videos. Remember, we're looking at Kaltura, we're digging deeply into that. And they're asking questions about why were these videos considered exceptional and, um, and who was watching them the most? Why were people watching them for an unexpected length of time? And, and who was pausing and leaving, or abandoning, right? They could see who interacted with the video platform. And they could see um, things like which questions associated with those were being missed. And all of this goes to inform their instructional designers on best practices for their very unique environment across, literally around the world. Anywhere, Alfonso said, anywhere the U.S. can do business, Caterpillar are there, and thus Watershed are as well. And when you launch a course to something like 250,000 people, these trends like frequently missed questions, they really emerge very quickly. And so CAT were able to really kind of exploit those trends and address the trainings uh, very specifically to those inaccuracies. So was it inaccuracy of the question or was it something needed to be addressed globally if somebody like 80% of the population were missing a certain question? But further, they future-proof. Um, so because the ecosystem was already in place, this was like in 2017 or 2018 when they went live. Uh, I guess I could go back and look at that. Um, it was successful in, when the pandemic hit. Uh, in less than four weeks, CAT were able to transition all prioritized learning onto the virtual platform. Uh, and that spiked. It was 1,200% more in learners uh, address, getting onto that platform at its peak in, uh, than, it, than at its peak in 2019. So that was pretty cool that they shifted their in-class experts. They shifted all those people to develop digital content. They leaned into data. Alfonso noted on one of our webinars that um, 
it was like uh, it was like being temporarily blind, and they had to utilize a different sense, not sense with data, and they became more agile for it. All right, shifting slightly, we're going to talk about crisis response, which sort of goes along with what we just talked about. Um, this is a kind of common theme that came up when the pandemic hit, and that was about readiness and agility of forward-thinking companies, and the stories. Um, that data told to better inform how learning and development could help people, help their employees. Um, in the case of PwC, this was a, uh, a webinar we did about crisis response. Um, when the pandemic hit, PwC's crisis response team was largely placed as, praised as uh, one of the best in the market. They very quickly deployed a response team globally. That was the first thing that they did. Um, they doubled the, their digital learning offerings, and they fed data, a ton of data, from their already established ecosystem uh, to human development leaders and global CIOs. And that helped show what people were looking for. And ultimately, that helped them make local decisions to serve up relevant content in a real, honest, moment-of-need fashion. Um, so they empowered this by focusing on the data, of course, and search analytics was the key. Uh, there are things like search results from areas across the ecosystem, um, but these areas that were initially experiencing the pandemic, so specifically China and Italy, they wanted to see if possible trends that could um, that were emerging from those areas could uh, affect all territories and ultimately would affect all territories. So they began to see searches across the ecosystem for things like establishing trust online and working from home and overall wellness stress ergonomics, things like that. Um, and they wanted to ensure that PwC employees knew that they were being cared for uh, and they would have easy access to the top learning content based on their colleagues' search data. So again, they established this rapid response team. They're daily reviewing what people are searching for in order to make decisions about what to do in the future. And their digital learning ecosystem had massive adoption. They had over 2,500% increase in launches of COVID material in the first month of the pandemic. So now the ecosystem is part of the lexicon again at PwC. It's a benefit of working for them. They have uh, you know, badges associated with them as well. So people want to go work there, learn more, and share those badges and share their experience and socially share it across the, the ecosystem as well. And Interestingly enough, throughout this incredibly stressful time, the net promoter score actually increased for the L&D team. Um, now, PwC have uh, been interested in engagement and adoption of the ecosystem since launch, of course, but the data told stories that was a lot more about how to help colleagues about wellness and about things like what was changing daily, what continues to change, frankly, um, and what, how could they have immediate insight and then impact on their employee trends. It, frankly, I find that to be incredibly inspiring. Okay, we're gonna shift a little bit. Um, this is a company, Applied Industrial Technologies, um, who have been a longtime uh, friend and, uh, and customer of Watershed. Andy there is just absolutely amazing. He's what I'd call uh, a seasoned practitioner. He blazed trails in the space of learning analytics for some time and applying analytics to his learning programs. I think he's been doing this for about six or seven years as well. Um, this isn't so much an ecosystem story though. It, it does, they have an ecosystem, um, but this is much more about kind of advanced methodology and application of data to drive change across the entire organization, just how L&D can affect the entire organization. So uh, as I mentioned, they have an ecosystem. It's completely SAP with the exception of a few things, obviously watersheds in there, a company called Zappy Apps is in there as well for some uh, for capturing coaching data. Um, and they've created a very complex kind of spider web, if you will, uh, that gives them operational data and learning data, sales data, basically you name it. Uh, and they also happen to have um, Shauna, uh, who is there, who's kind of uh, an analytics genius, and she's behind the scenes just serving up amazing insights constantly. So they've got a great team in place, which is a theme. Um, you know, very often it, it really helps to be able to have the right team in place to get started in this space of learning analytics. So that's another theme that I would, I would certainly bring up. Um, I was on an advisory panel call just yesterday. Uh, no, sorry, it was 
two days ago, but somebody on the advisory panel posed this question or rather a statement. He said something along the lines of, um, if you're in learning and development, ask your HR team what some key metrics of each division are within their company and how L&D is serving those metrics. Uh, and then he went on to say they won't know. Um, and I definitely find that to be kind of similar. Again, we sometimes don't have insight into those metrics. We don't necessarily have insight into the performance, right? We simply have insight into what's going on within L&D. So uh, I thought that was an interesting point that he said. But, you know, I guess it's a good question, right? Do you know the top critical co competencies and key performing indicators for the divisions you are tasked with helping? What Andy would say at Applied is pick five or six. That's what he did. Um, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed here to say that I don't know that you could read those, but I'll read them here from uh, top kind of clockwise. So these are the ones that Andy found initially. Inventory, or at least for this example, inventory, financial acumen, freight, SAP usage, vendor chargebacks, pricing and accounts receivable. So those are the competency areas the KPIs are the performance percentages, things like time and past due, things like that. Um, and again, these are not things that a lot of L&D teams have visibility into, and yet we're supposed to develop people who are evaluated on these competencies and KPIs. It's a bit head scratching. Here's how we did it. Uh, Andy went and spoke with the heads of each of these groups, all of the different divisions, and he found that if his team, L&D, could help improve upon these specific areas, L&D would help move all of these divisions forward. So he was then able to map these competencies using his SAP and watershed and the KPIs, and then compare divisions, geographies, individuals, uh, so he could actually target training exactly where it was needed. And ultimately, it led to a huge uptake in utilization, which was great because not only could he engaged with people, but he could prove that those who took training vastly outperformed those who did not. And that honestly gets buy-in across the board. Of course, you know, they are an advanced organization. They also gather, like, as I mentioned, coaching data um, and kind of real world competency assessments. Um, so they're also looking at things like in the real world, uh, does your competency match your KPI or match your assessments? Um, so they have kind of some side by side things going on there. Just a phenomenal person to talk with. Love to bring Andy on one of these talks here in the future. Uh, but they also look at things like top searches, which is fairly universal as well. Top articles shared, um, and they make educated decisions about their employees and the future learning programs utilizing that. Uh, but ultimately, they create a sense of community by sharing that stuff. And really, what they've done is they've overall just woven L and D into the culture at Applied Industrial at every level globally. All right, my last story here. Um, and again, this is universal. If you have a learning ecosystem, and you probably do, even if you don't know it, uh, you need to apply analytics to it. Um, I read in a, a ATV report of like a month ago about the future of, uh, of our industry Basically, that adding watershed learning analytics, that's the only pricing I know, so forgive me, uh, is if you add it to your mix, it's on average like a single percent of your total spend uh, annually, and it just empowers so much. So I would really encourage everyone to, to look into this. Um, one of the slides mentioned uh, that the funny thing is, or, or one of our customers, rather, um, who I didn't have in, in these slides, mentioned uh, on a webinar the measuring business impact of learning webinar that we did the other day that the funny thing is once you apply, uh, you know, learning analytics, it very quickly pays for itself. Uh, and so, you know, here's how, um, all right. We looked at that visa ecosystem earlier. So I kind of just want to put this up to get your heads back into it. Uh, remember there's degree on the front end, right behind it, all these awesome tools, cornerstone, learn, LinkedIn learning, all that stuff. Remember all that data is coming into watershed. We're layering it with Workday, right? So we're laying, layering it with uh, that HR on top. Um, and of course, just looking at this, you can tell this is a pretty massive spend, but it's obviously um, you know, purposeful. The reason why Gordon and the team at Visa initially built this again was to make sure that they're best serving their end customer. And I'm certain that's universal. That's what you want to do as well, right? You want to make training ideal for your customers. It's an absolute win-win. So again, 
um, in a way, Visa began utilizing watershed uh, and learning analytics in general, almost like a vendor management tool. So keep this in mind. They are looking at things like uh, platform popularity and uptick. So they could see um, things like, you know, year over year. And that's a little bit like kind of what was going on with Caterpillar, what the uptick versus year over year or month by month or day by day. Um, but you could also see things like just platform uh, popularity in general. Uh, so you're putting these platforms up, you're kind of measuring the, the performance of each of them. My dog's whining, my apologies. But imagine, um, and this is a real world scenario, if you had two similar software platforms and you're doing a pilot or a proof of concept for those two things, and you put them up here and you're actually able to see learner engagement when and where, and you're seeing what's sticking. In this case, this is what Visa have done. So uh, they had two systems that were basically competing against one another, and they were able to dismiss the one that was underperforming um, over time. And I think it was over a six month time, maybe it was over a year. But here's the key, they retained that data because remember when I mentioned earlier the democratization of data. Well, if all of your data exists in a standard, clean format inside an LRS, just imagine how much easier it would be when you inevitably switch learning management systems in the future. Uh, and just remember, please, this is your data. So I always talk about vendor management and the aspects of applying learning analytics to your ecosystem because it just feels to me to be such a responsible thing to do but it's only one slice of the pie. Um, so whenever anybody asks me, hey, where do I start? I always say, you know, you probably already have a learning ecosystem. You probably, uh, if you've gone down the path of getting an LXP, you probably already have an LMS. You might have multiple LMSs. If you have an LMS, you probably have some survey tool outside of it. You probably have something like that. So let's just start there. Let's see what's performing. Let's gather some data and then let's slice and dice it. And let's start asking some question of it. Um, one more, and this is a fairly common thing. Uh, people love this. It's around scrap learning. This is how is my content being utilized? That's a great question to ask. So in this example, uh, our customer thought they had a $16 per person per year library license cost, right? But when you looked at the utilization, they were actually paying a full $8 more, $24 per user per year, because not that, ent that entire population was not engaging or utilizing that, that content. And I think that's really powerful information to go back to your vendor with. Hey, you can renegotiate that deal if you have data behind it. Of course, on the flip side, you could also say, hey, maybe we need to market our learning library a little bit differently um, or utilize some social or go to the people who are engaging with it and ask them questions. Is this actually beneficial for others? Can you help me promote that as well? Whatever the case is. Okay. Well, that was a lot. Uh, I am so, so grateful. Thank you so much for letting me share a few of these stories on how some of our customers are practically applying learning analytics to their ecosystem. Um, we're really proud of everybody there. And I'm really, you know, as I mentioned, kind of we're, we're proud of the job that we're doing together. We're very much partners of these folks and our community is incredibly welcoming and warming. Um, so if you'd like to reach out to me, um, I will, or maybe Steve will post my, um, my email address and I'm happy to you know, connect to you with those folks. We'd love to talk with you. If you'd um, like to learn a bit more about what we do, um, there is the measuring business impact of learning right there. I don't know. Just download that free ebook. I can't imagine that you could click on that and actually get it, but uh, go ahead and try. In the meantime, I'm going to get a link. Uh, unless Ash is on, we'll get a link and we'll throw it up there for you guys to go and uh, look at that report. Um, as you had mentioned, uh, again, if you're in London next week or if you're in Orlando the week after at ATD, please come by and say hi. Uh, we would love to see you at the LTG booth. Um, thank you again, Steve. Thank you again, all of the CLO folks. I think we do have some questions. So I'm going to take a quick look here. Um, oh, awesome. Joe, you got it. Okay, so let's see. Steve, is there a best way for me to share my email address? Yeah, so I actually just put it into the attendee chat. <laughs> so if everybody wants to go to the attendee chat, I just put Bill's email address in there. Uh, so if you don't see it, just uh, go ahead and open up that tab right now. 
Okay, cool. In the meantime, I'm going to find another one, which is uh, the report I had mentioned like 500 times about um, measuring the business impact of learning. All right. Can I share this one as well, Steve? I, I'm sorry. You, you said that and I totally spaced it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so I put the email address into the attendee chat. So if you want to go ahead and put that link into the attendee chat as well, they should all be able to see that now. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Let's see if I can do that. Attendee chat. Perfect. Yep, that okay, works. Okay, cool. Okay, excellent. Yeah, please, please do um, check that out. It was good. And also, the webinar that went along with that was really interesting. And I, and I mean that from a, a, a sincerely, it was, it was pretty fascinating to just listen to others talk about, um, about this journey that, uh, that we're all on. Um, okay, so let's see. Some of the questions are um, about, you know, counting the videos watched, things like that. Um, were they also aligning that with the actual work and um, processes? Yeah, so, you know, one thing I didn't show or talk about is, um, I can't see myself anymore. I hope this is cool. Uh, my dog's walking around. Things are weird. We're still in the pandemic. <laughs> but uh, one thing I didn't talk about is, um, is looking at a program. So, you know, very often people have against this, uh, along this ecosystem, a video that might come out uh, it, it, within a program, like say onboarding, you might have a a PDF, um, a, a, a video that would be like an acknowledgement, like, hey, welcome to the company or whatever that has to be watched. There might be some compliance training, things like that. That's a program. And again, getting back to the ecosystem issue, one thing that's a bit um, challenging is is getting insight into what's going on across all of those different um, uh, aspects of the program. I'm probably not telling you guys anything you don't already know. But one cool thing about you know, you know utilizing an LRS is you can gather all that together and start saying, wow, you know, my group is 25% completed with this video and, you know, 50% completed with this content or whatever, what's going on, things like that. You could also see how long people are spending in the program itself, stuff like that. So um, I think that would be aligned to an aspect of the process, uh, but you could also align that video to, you know, whatever that intended outcome was. If it's like having better, you know, safety uh, instance, um, and I don't mean incidents. What I meant by that is observations. So if it was something like I want to encourage observations to decrease in incidents, I could look at that safety training um, or, you know, whatever, and see if those videos are actually kind of affecting that. And um, Christina, I'm not sure that, that answers your question. Uh, it's probably a, a bigger conversation, uh, but that's that's one I, I did kind of want to address. Um, and the report's been out there. There's another question. Um, Let's see, ask the question, our managing partner said we don't have any. What would you suggest competency area for a law firm? Well, that's fascinating. So the question is competency areas for law firms. So what we've done in the past there is to look at the specific um, kind of, it's a great question, uh, the specific job. Gosh, that's a good one, Vanessa. So basically it's like, hey, I'm at a law firm. Uh, you know, what are our competencies? What are our key performance indi indicators? Um, so in our specific world, it would be things like, you know, responding to salespeople when uh, we need legal calls and things like that. Uh, but, you know, it, it really kind of depends. Again, we could have a, a much deeper conversation on that, uh, Vanessa, particularly if you would like to, um, you know, talk with GP Strategies, who are um, our sister company, who really focus on helping people kind of figure out that measurement, what you should go out and measure. Um, and, and again, Email me. Let's do this. Um, okay, let's see. Beverly, I have Success Factors as an HR platform in Tableau, which connects to Oracle as ERP. But Success Factors and Tableau currently don't speak. Could you get info from both? Both? Yes, totally. That's exactly it. So um, that's a pretty common thing too. Hey, these guys aren't speaking. Uh, we do. Uh, and in fact, you know, within Watershed specifically, we have kind of native integrations with Tableau, so we can spit that data out to Tableau directly. Uh, but that, that's a huge benefit for a lot of our customers. Um, another question, uh, do most LMSs have an LRS component? Amazing question. Um, trying to think of how to say this. We've heard that most LMSs say they have an LRS component, uh, but uh, you know, typically watershed, and I love our LMS partners, they're the amazing. Some of them actually do, but I wouldn't say most. Typically when we bring 
LMS data in. And by the way, for every single customer we have, we at least have one LMS. Um, that data is brought in uh, via CSV. So that would be a, a you know scheduled dump of data into Watershed. It is then converted into uh, XAPI. I am boring myself talking about that already. So please forgive me. But what I'm trying to do is tell you uh, the um, by definition, an LRS has to speak to another LRS. Uh, and we have not seen too, too many that actually do that very well. Um, we're happy to help with those folks if they want to go down a path uh, of any LMS um, provider to, to get that sorted out. If an LMS has Rust to see uh, engine or content controller on the back end, then yes, they would have uh, an element that we could, we could get that data out, extract that data a little bit easier. Uh, and a lot of those do. Complex question uh, and a really complex answer. So my apologies. Let's see. Uh, how does Vizier play into these capabilities? Great question. So we have a formal partnership with Degreed. Um, Vizier also have a formal partnership with Reed. Um, and so I've had to address this a lot in the past year. Vizier really, um, what we would normally say is Vizier really focused on people analytics and Watershed really focus on learning analytics. We don't see ourselves as competitors by any means. We see ourselves as kind of complement complementary in the um, in the space and um, where we would focus on things like you know what people are doing in their journey and um, we could also uh, you know kind of um, there is an element I guess of people analytics to watershed because again we are showing you what learner behavior is but uh, we're not focusing on things that typically HR would be concerned with around you know which a lot of busier does excellent jobs on things like you know um, how long has this person gone without uh, a pay increase or things like that. So uh, we, we do differentiate ourselves there a little bit. Uh, let's see. Do the integrations into Watershed with all the systems rely solely on XAPI? Matthew, thank you for asking that question. No, um, the majority of Watershed integrations are not XAPI. Um, so I mentioned Agreed 5 million times. I do that because they have a really strong XAPI connection to us. Um, and a lot of those others do as well. Uh, we're working on it with EdCast. We're working on, or we have it with uh, LinkedIn Learning. So we do have a lot of uh, XAPI connections. Now, the only reason why that's really important, a couple reasons why those are, that's really important, is it's really easy to get a high fidelity of data into Watershed. It's an easier connection. Um, however, as I mentioned, the majority of Watershed customers do not have a full ecosystem of XAPI um, data connections. Okay, that said, I have to caveat it. Inside the tool, it's converted to XAPI. And again, this is where it gets really boring and geeky, but it isn't because the output of that is um, apples to apples. So in other words, I am looking at normalized data. I'm looking at um, Bill completed this course in this system and Bill sold this thing in this system and they look the same. That's why XAPI is really powerful. There's been a lot of talk in the past about all the cool stuff it can do, and it can do a lot of cool stuff, but for the most practical application that we're doing every day for all of our customers, that's what it is. Um, so let's see, what else? This is great. Um, oh gosh. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, have you given service to Spanish speaking companies? Absolutely. So Beverly, thank you for asking the question. So have you given spent, uh, you, you know, service to any uh, non-English speaking company? Yeah. So, um, the way that that's really handled in Watershed is uh, all of the reports can be manipulated to whatever language. You would just go in and kind of change that, and the data that's coming in will come uh, will be displayed in that native language as well. So that's how we've typically handled that. Um, you ask about uh, service. I, I wonder if that means kind of more like customer service or something like that. Uh, we certainly have and can go down that path as well. Uh, as I mentioned, almost all of our customers are operating globally. Um, and so, you know, we have we have a mix uh, in that with that respect of kind of who we serve. Let's see what else. I'm really appreciating your guys' questions, and frankly, I'm pretty happy that I can answer them. Uh, we have a talent analytics partner, and we're trying to bring into the data warehouse both performance data and learning data. Oh, what are the types of learning analytics that you have seen to demonstrate the connection between the two? So we're talking. Thanks, Siri. We're talking. Oh no, she's really going to listen to me. We're talking about talent analytics and uh, performance and learning data. What are the types of analytics that you have seen to demonstrate the connections between those two? L&D professionals don't seem to want to measure beyond engagement and attendance. 
Marcus, great one. Uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I it, ah, this is weird, but I guess I've seen a lot of L and D professionals at um, levels uh, who who are just gung ho about applying analytics, kind of really push this forward. So um, the types of learning analytics that I've seen to demonstrate connections between the two, the, the most obvious that comes out to me um, around performance in learning would be something like um, I'm looking at a graph of performance and I'm seeing interactions, uh, learning interactions to see if that performance has changed over time uh, or something along the lines of, um, you know, pre and post assessment, which is uh, something that we do quite a bit of. So here's a pretest, here's an interaction, here's a post test, and we'll look at the differences there, the delta uh, to see kind of what's gone on. Um, uh, Marcus, if you'd like to shoot me an email, I'll, I'll gladly send you over some more uh, kind of, you know, uh, information about that. Even we can even get um, as specific as showing you uh, specific reports that have been helpful uh, for that too. So if any of you guys want to send me, um, sorry, if any of y'all want to send me an email, please do. Um, how many integrations are you adding in the next couple of years? Do you have a large list, but some of our vendors are not on there. So I'm just curious about how often you're working with LMB platforms and providers to offer integrations. Great question. Um, and I, I mentioned this, but it may have been lost. Um, that list I showed is called Works with Watershed. We literally launched that today. It used to be called um, Watershed, I don't know, something else. Uh, but anyway, the fact is, those are just the ones that are most recognizable, if I'm honest with you. That's the marketing and sales side of me. Uh, we integrate. If you can get access to the data, let's do it. Let's pull it in. Um, so we... Uh, uh, don't really have a set number who we're going to go out and uh, target to bring into that works with watershed. It is purely driven by our customer demand. And we really rely on our customers to go out and lean into that a little bit as well. So one of our customers, a very large uh, the cell phone company here in the States, um, did a phenomenal job of leaning into their vendors to get XAPI adoption, which was awesome for us, awesome for the community, and also really good for those vendors ultimately. We will help through that as well. Um, so if you have, uh, if you're looking at some integrations um, that are outside of the realm of what I spoke with, shoot me an email. Let's talk. Let's let's uh, let's get it going or whatever. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, how many integrations? That's it. Oh my gosh, I think we're done. Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, because there's customer data on um, and, and reports on that that have. You know, we've gotten authorization to share on a webinar, but not necessarily authorization to share directly with customers. Um, if you want to see this again or have a, or dive into this again or share this kind of presentation with anybody, please reach out. Uh, WatershedLRS.com. You can get to me directly or anybody on our team um, will help out gladly. Uh, uh, but again, we really can't share it uh, just blindly, but we would love to go through and have that conversation with all y'all. What else? I think that's it. My gosh, thank you. This has been great. I was honestly a little nervous. Uh, it's just been, it's been a while since I've done one of these. So thank you all for being so uh, supportive and great. And Steve, again, thank you. Uh, you've been great.